We start today with the first economic model we are going to use in order to make sense of a set of stylized facts we documented so far. Just to remember, there are wide disparities in terms of income levels across countries that poorer countries, under the same conditions, tend to grow faster initially and seem to slow down to some long-run trend the most developed economies seem to follow. In order to, in order to do so, we'll make reference to the work of Robert Solo, who published a model in 1956 that can help us make sense of those stylized facts. The Solo model builds on two key concepts. First, the idea that we can represent the production side of the economy through the means of an aggregate production function. That is, a function of capital, think of machines and buildings used by businesses, and labor, essentially the number of workers. These are combined and together with some measure of the technology level, give rise to gross domestic product. The second concept is the idea that the change in aggregate capital is given by aggregate investment minus existing capital depreciation. Together with national accounting identities, Robert Solo built a model that can capture key insights about growth dynamics and rationalize the, sty the stylized facts we presented before. We now discuss some properties of the production function that are necessary in the context of the Solo model. The first is that when holding labor fixed and technology fixed, increases in capital lead to more output, but at a decreasing rate. In other words, the production function exhibits decreasing returns to scale in capital. The intuition for this comes back to the example we looked before. If you give one tractor to a farmer that has none, output will increase a lot more if compared with how much output would rise if the same tractor would be given to a farmer that already owns one. The same property is assumed for labor and the intuition is similar. If you have a computer and hire a computer programmer, it is clear that the amount of computer code that is now produced will be much larger than any additional programmer you may hire to work if it doesn't have another computer available. This means that the production function has also decreasing returns to scale in labor. The last property of the production function we will use concerns what happens when we double the amount of capital and labor at the same time. We will assume that if both inputs are double, so will output. This means the production function exhibits constant returns to scale in capital and labor. This last property, constant returns to scale, allows us to rewrite the production function in per capita terms. If we divide both sides of the production function by L, what we get is a mapping between output per worker and capital per worker that exhibits decreasing returns to scale, just as we see in the plot. This means that as capital per worker increases, the marginal return of an additional unit of capital decreases, and so will output growth rate. In particular, we will use a particular functional form for the production function that has the properties we discussed, studied by Charles Cobb, and Paul Douglas in the first half of the 20th century, built on earlier work by Philip Wickstead. The function inherited their name and became known as the Cobb-Douglas production function. So we get that output is given by the level of technology multiplied by capital raised to a constant, smaller than one in absolute value, multiplied again by labor raised to one minus that constant. It is very easy to verify that this functional form satisfies all the intuitive properties we discussed before. Growth accounting is a technique that was introduced also by Robert Solo in 1957. It starts with the production function we just introduced. Then we apply the natural logarithm function to both sides of the equation and realize that the Cobb-Douglas production function is linear in logs. Now, if such a relationship is true for a given t, it might also be true for t plus 1. So write down the production function in logs for t plus 1 and subtract the same function but now for t. Since the natural logarithm of 1 plus x 
is approximately equal to x, we can group terms and get that the growth rate of output can be written as a linear combination of the growth rate in technology, the growth rate in capital, and the growth rate in labor. Now that we can use national accounts data to get output, infer the capital stock, and use data from labor service for labor inputs, however, the level of technology cannot be di directly observed. But since we already have data on output, capital, and labor, we can back out the values of technology, technological change. Technology is therefore the residual of the production function equation and became known precisely as the solar residual. This exercise allowed to characterize periods of economic fluctuations and have a first pass at identifying the determinants of such periods, whether they are due to technology, capital, or labor. Note also that if we ignore growth in technology just for simplification purposes, the growth rate of output per capita can be written simply as a linear function of output per capita. We'll make use of this later. Before we dive into the derivation of the solo model, let's look at the economic meaning of the exponents of capital and labor in the Cobb-Douglas production function. Think of a representative firm that maximizes profits by choosing the amounts of capital and labor to use in its production process. Profits are given by price times quantity. For simplicity, let's just assume a price of one. Then the maximization problem for the firm is just to maximize output expressed as a Cobb-Douglas function of technology, capital, and labor, minus the cost of using capital and labor. Let it be so that each unit of capital costs RT to the firm, the rental price of capital, and each unit of labor costs WT, the wage rate. Taking first order conditions of this optimization problem, we, de we get expressions for the rental price of capital and the wage rate. These are capital and labor demand equations as they relate prices, the rental price of capital and the wage rate, and quantities, the amounts of capital and labor that are optimal to use for each price. We can rearrange these two conditions in a way such that we realize that alpha is equal to the rental price of capital times the capital used in the production process divided by output. And a similar expression for one minus alpha that the wage rate times the amount of labor units used divided by output. These two ratios represent effectively factor shares. That is, total payments to each factor as a share of total wealth created in the production process, which, as we can see, add up to one. Let capital accumulate following kt plus one equals one minus delta times kt plus it, where it is gross aggregate investment at day t and delta is a constant depreciation rate, positive and smaller than one. Rearranging, we get that kt plus one minus kt is equal to it minus delta times kt, which ju just means that the change in capital stock is given by gross investment minus total depreciation. In other words, net investment. But where does investment come from? Families allocate their net income to consumption and savings, which means that yt minus delta kt is equal to ct plus st. Assuming a costing savings rate, we then have that total savings is just a share S of total net income and consumption is a share one minus S. This means that savings and consumption are a fixed part of income. Assuming we are in, we are in a closed economy with no government, we have that output equals consumption plus investment. Subtract delta times KT from both sides and we see that net production will be used either as consumption or as net investment. Substituting this last equation, the expression for consumption we got from before, and get that yt minus delta kt is equal to 1 minus s times yt minus delta kt plus it minus delta kt. We can simplify this and rearrange to show that net savings equals net investment. That is, s times yt minus delta times kt is equal to yt minus delta kt. We now use the capital accumulation equation 
And this last result to get that the change in capital, which is given by kt plus 1 minus kt, is equal to investment at time t minus delta kt, which is equal to s times yt minus delta kt. Divide both sides by kt and get that the growth rate of capital at time t is equal to the savings rate times output over capital, minus the savings times the, de times the depreciation rate. Notice that yt over kt is the average product, and the behavior of this ratio is going to be fundamental for our understanding of how the solo model dynamics work. But more on that later. We are going to assume that population grows at a constant rate n, and that the labor force is a constant share of the population. Together, these imply that the number of workers also grows at the same rate. Let's make a pause to summarize what we got so far. If we drop time subscripts, we have that, first, the growth rate of capital per worker is given by the difference in growth rates between the capital stock and population. This is true for any variable and is true also for output per worker. Second, the growth rate of capital is given by the product of the savings rate with the average product, minus the savings rate times depreciation. Third, population grows at a constant rate, n. Fourth, if we divide both the numerator and the denominator of the average product by the size of the population, we see that they cancel each other and therefore the average product is the, sum, is the same regardless of being expressed in absolute or per capita terms. Substituting 1, 3 and 4 into equation 2, we finally get the solo model equation, where growth rate of capital per capita is given by the savings rate times the average product minus a second term given by the sum of the product of the savings and depreciation rates with the population growth rate. Remember also from growth accounting that the growth rate of output per capita is simply given by alpha times the growth rate of capital per capita. So we can get the equation for output growth. Note that since output per capita is a monotonic function of capital per capita, pretty, mu pretty much all the analysis we can make with respect to capital per capita will also apply to output per capita. Hence, we will mostly focus on the former, even though it is output per capita that is our proxy for welfare.